in 2022, a team of conservationists, naturalists, and volunteers embarked on a quest to discover a rare beetle in the vast Dartmoor National Park. Such a big woodland, how are you going to find this thing? By spending several days and challenging nights. We have to be really mindful of ticks when we're doing our work. It's a bit tricky going out at night, obviously. There's fallen branches, rocks and things like that. Walking through the temperate rainforest towards the ancient woodlands. About five miles of, of, of walking and it's five hours of, of searching as well. It will be hiding under bits of moss like this. Yeah, have a look, yeah, because that looks a perfect bit. In the hope of discovering the hidden population of the blue ground beetle. Yeah, it is not totally safe from extinction. It still needs to be conserved. Nestled in the heart of southwest England, this 300 million year old granite land is an abode to a diverse range of habitats. Shaped by both natural forces and the people who have lived here over the last 10,000 years. It is home to some rare plant and animal species especially a beetle, which the country might be on the brink of losing, and whose survival depends on the growth and continuity of a certain habitat. To make this possible, a project was set up in 2022 by Bug Life. We've previously worked with Blue Ground Beetle in the UK and um, in the spring 2022 we started our Dartmoor Blue Ground Beetle project. Where finding the new site was the main goal for the team. When we first started the project we had conversations with, with John Walters and with Dartmoor National Park and with, um, with other people locally. John Walters is an expert naturalist and entomologist who is a crucial part of this project. Since I was about three years old, I was looking at insects and I still am now and I'm getting on towards 60 now. His knowledge and experience will be key in finding any new population. I found out about this rare beetle and I really wanted to see it. So I wandered through the woodland looking under bits of logs and stones trying to find the beetle. And I thought, well, it's such a big woodland. How are you going to find this thing? But uh, then I, I saw a tree ahead of me with some peeling bark on it. And I pulled back the bark and there was this amazing, it caught the sunlight and this fantastic blue beetle sort of glinting in the sunshine. I'll, I'll never forget that moment of seeing that beetle for the first time. But there's still you know, things to find out and, and new sites to find for it as well. His 20 years of observation will be invaluable in assessing the habitat's quality and to know if it can support the beetles. This project is also an initiative of introducing citizen science, where local people are encouraged to participate in these expeditions. There are only a handful of sites in the country, restricted only to the southwest of England and South Wales. Beetle has been here obviously since the, the ice retreated after the last ice age and, and and the UK was joined to France at that time. So during the, during the Ice Age, the beetle was found only way down in the south of France. And after the last Ice Age, the woodlands began to advance further north and the beetle came with it. But it can't fly, so it has to just walk. It walks along and it came here. It settled in what now became southern England when the channel formed. And then it's remained here ever since. And then at one point it was thought to be extinct. And then in the 1980s, someone found it uh, just on the southern edge of Dartmoor. Since then, only 13 sites have been known in the whole of the United Kingdom, of which Dartmoor's oak woodlands contain the most sites. 
The beetle has remained unnoticed in these small pockets of ancient woodland, which are now rare and cover only 2.5% of the country. Maintaining those woodlands is essential really to keep the, the beetle going, but then to somehow connect those woodlands together. So the biggest challenge in this project really is trying to con reconnect the populations of the blue ground beetle in this country. After setting up the project, the team had to decide how and where to start. We had a, a number of sites which we wanted to go and look for. We looked at maps at where the known sites were and looked at woodlands that kind of were either connected to them or, or kind of close by to them that had the potential to harbour populations of the beetle. So we've trained a couple of local volunteers up in um, kind of habitat survey. So they go out in the daytime and they, they basically kind of look around these sites and they, they see whether the habitat looks like it might be suitable for the beetles. So the first site we visited, um, it looked quite hopeful. It looked like there was quite a high chance of finding the beetles there. There was quite a lot of dead wood. The trees looked kind of old, they were mossy. But we, we walked around the wood and it felt quite dry, um, which isn't a kind of brilliant indicator that you're going to find lots of ground beetles because there's not an awful lot of slugs present. One of them particularly was in the Dark Valley and it had a particular interest for me because the, the man who originally found the blue ground beetle in Britain was a man called Alfred Leach in 1811. He was living at a place where we wanted to go and look for the beetle so it's quite exciting to go to a place where I knew he'd been. He hadn't seen the beetle there but it must have been all around him. So we waited for a good night, got the team of people together and we went through the big gates to the manor and we went up the drive and started to search. Looking spot but it will be hiding under bits of moss like this. You know, have a look yeah because that looks a perfect bit. Yeah, it likes to get in between the, the, the bark on a dead lump of a dead log and in this sort of woody soil type area here, yeah. And they'll make a little cell in here or they'll just sit here during the daytime. Perfect bit of wintering or, you know, during the spring and summer, that's the sort of place it will rest during the daytime. It's nice and damp under there. Because it, you know, it might get quite warm and dry in the rest of the woodland, but it maintains the moisture and that's what they need. They don't tend to like places with an awful lot of kind of ground floor, an awful lot of plants on the ground. They tend to like places with dead wood, with lots of dead wood. They also quite like um, south facing slopes where we think it's a bit more sheltered. And there tends to quite often be some water present, um, quite often rivers or streams on the sites, but it's not a necessity. The habitat looks positive but the team shall wait until dark for their quarry to emerge. Well, it's starting to get dark now that the slugs will start to emerge. So what we're gonna do is search on the tree trunk. This is a tree slug, it's a slightly smaller slug and this is a specialist slug which lives on tree trunks. So it is actually the favourite food of the blue ground beetle because the blue ground beetle is living on the, spending or spending a lot of time on tree trunks. So it's most likely to encounter this one. But it will also tackle bigger prey. So we have on Dartmoor the world's largest slug, which is the ash black slug. And this is a monster, it can grow up to a foot long, about 30 centimetres long, a really big one. It will detect the slime that the slug leaves, so it will actually follow the slime trail of the slug. And then when it finds the slug, it's got, the beetle's got great big pincer jaws, and it grabs onto the slug. The slug tries to get away, but it can't at this stage, it's doomed. The team has been searching for several hours now, and after such irrefutable evidence, they are determined to find the beetle. As they move ahead to a different patch of woodland, something grabs their attention. Two quite similar looking species we get on Dartmoor. Often it's a, a violet ground beetle, but once you know the blue ground beetle, once you've seen one, it's, it's quite distinctive. It was getting late and the team was about to call it off for the day. Until one of the volunteers found one.
pretty impressive insect. The project's been pretty successful so far, I think. It's fabulous to see it in a place where we knew leech had stayed. So it was a, a special moment for me to see that. And because it, it joined up a couple of the sites that we knew about, so we'd found a site further up along the valley. So it was good to find a site in between. So the beetle can now have a, a, a stable population in a big block of woodland. It was just really lovely to see such a kind of relatively unknown beetle just kind of catch the imagination of so many people and so many people kind of became interested in it. We had lots of landowners getting in touch saying that they thought they might have them on their land. We had new volunteers come forward. People are really excited to kind of discover that these things live in their local areas and they really want to be a part of that. After the work, all the surveys we've done through the Blue Ground Beetle Project, we now know it from 15 UK sites. And although two sites may not sound like an enormous increase, as a kind of percentage of, of 13, Two is quite a large number to find in a year, so we're really very, very excited to have made those new discoveries and we really hope that we might find more again in the future. It was just fantastic. It just felt really good to be part of something so positive. I also think it's a great way to uh, raise awareness of conservation. And because it's linked to a product, it gives them a connection to it. And it's then really nice sometimes when you walk into a shop that sells your product and you hear someone selling it talking about the blue ground beetle from information you have given them it's it's great it's, it means the words being spread and and that that nocturnal beetle is, is getting its moment people are knowing about it now <laughs>